Good afternoon. We start the second day of the WCRI conference with a wonderful speaker on a topic that's germane to each of us, health equity and the COVID-19 vaccinations. Our presenter is Dr. Jewel Mullen. She's an internist, epidemiologist, public health expert, and the former Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health and Acting Director for the National Vaccine Program Office in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you for joining us today. I'm happy to be with you. Thanks. Last summer, the NIH and the CDC asked the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine to construct a framework to assist policymakers with creating an equitable distribution of the COVID-19 vaccines. As a member of that committee, can you tell us about the criteria used in developing the framework and the resulting plan? I'd be happy to. I was so happy that that committee was convened and thrilled to be a member of it. But the reason I was happy it was convened is that COVID had given so many of us in this country and in the world a, a new window into health disparities and the unfairness that exists in so many components of the healthcare system. And we knew that as vaccines were developed scientifically and efficiently and effectively, they would also come out at a time when there wouldn't be enough for everyone not everyone in this country, not everyone in the world. And so a scarce resource, who should get it first, pulls on a very fundamental question of equity. At a time when we have been grappling so much over the past year around what it means to really be fair and just in the way the vaccine should be distributed as we also thought more about how to have a more just healthcare system. So the committee took that charge very seriously and really spent time just thinking about what the ethical principle should be and landed on three. And in the whole framework, as we came up with these principles, we were thinking about individuals and all of society because we wanted to have uh, considerations in using the vaccine in a way that we wanted to reduce the, the risk of people transmitting. COVID-19, we wanted to reduce their risk of getting it. We wanted to reduce their risk of severe disease and death. And we wanted to reduce the risk to all of society. Because you recall, we're still in this conversation around public health versus the economy. And all of us have struggled. So the ethical principles for that framework uh, were to serve those risks. And we landed on three, maximizing the benefit, meaning that we were also going to consider who's most at harm, potential harm, and how to get the, the best reduction of those risks I was talking about. Assuring that the approach treated all people as they are of equal concern or equal regard. Nobody is any better or any greater value to society than anyone else. And a third, mitigating inequities, because we knew that COVID had not affected all populations evenly. So we really needed to think about those people in higher risk categories being able to be those who should emerge as higher and more likely candidates. But then we also had these other principles that I will just mention because they're also very important and they've played out over these months since, since the vaccine was actually authorized for use. Fairness that we were really applying these uh, principles in a way that people could see what we were doing transparently and that we would always be science or evidence-based in what we were doing. It's a lot, but that is very fundamental to, I think, not just how the vaccines should be treated, but how we should think about healthcare in general and distribution of health resources. That's quite a lot to take on to develop that framework. Um, since the discussion draft was released uh, roughly six months ago, how has the, that framework been executed? With complexity, with confusion, and with um, uh, what I think is a good civics lesson for us in this country and for a good global civics lesson if we think about distribution around the world. And the reason, reason I say that is that 
what you have on paper is really so fundamental to some values and moral principles, operationalizing them or making them live and work in a way that seems as simple as they look in black and white is not easy. And part of the so-called civics lesson that goes along with that is that in our country, while the federal government can issue recommendations, every state can create its own plan. So we had this um, framework that is still very relevant, but that every governor and, and, and legislature and public health agency and others, along with worker, uh, workforces and health systems could say, but this is how we're gonna do it in our state. And this is where we're gonna land. And, and what concerned me about that wasn't that it was going to be complex because it, it's inherently complex. What concerned me was that one of the ways in which people dealt with needing to stay clear headed and communicate a good plan was that some people started saying, thinking about things equitably is making it too confusing. And so, are, are you, so you never want people to think, or I at least don't, that you throw fairness and showing that all people are of equal regard out the window and that that makes things too complicated because if that's the mindset, it moves you farther away. Am I, yeah. am I sort of answering your question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, we've heard on the news that different jur jurisdictions are implementing the framework differently and by choice. Yes. So, Another question would be, have there been barriers to the distribution in general and the equitable distribution of it? And if there have been, how can we overcome those moving forward? Sure. And so I think I'm gonna dwell a little bit in the question you just asked me as I also answer this one, because um, the opportunity to have this conversation with you reinforces how important clear information and communication really, really are. And there's, there were a number of barriers that we knew we were going to face because we have been dealing with a pandemic for over a year now, understanding that our country was not adequately prepared and that our public health systems were not adequately resourced, resourced in terms of personnel, in terms of actual money for program development, in terms of information infrastructure, support for communications, uh, capability to manage a vaccine supply, uh, alongside also accommodating the needs of overwhelmed public health systems across a very diverse country of urban, rural, um, tribal jurisdictions. At a time, when beyond burnout, people also had to live in fear because there's so much distrust for science and the notion that somebody was actually trying to be fair and transparent. That made things even more difficult for um, rolling things out. If beyond what we can measure as equity, we want people to believe there's any fairness that people are still trying to achieve. But on top of that, um, I don't, I don't want to under, underestimate the impact of not having enough funding in the public health system, where the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials said the public health was short or it's probably needed a, a, an additional $6 billion to actually do this response well. And that wasn't just because of COVID, it was because public health agencies have been decreasingly underfunded for a decade now. On top of that, our country is very diverse, right? So what you can do in Minneapolis or New York City or Washington, DC is not the same as what you can do in rural Wyoming or many other places in terms of even access to people. So we were developing vaccines and the you know, Operation Warp Speed um, was developing vaccines that were not so simple to just transport. 
and you need a skill, skilled enough workforce to be able to administer them. So that once again, that infrastructure of people and equipment wasn't there. The other thing I keep wanting to go back to is the, in the earliest part of the rollout, we were dealing with scarcity. There was no way there was gonna be enough vaccine to go around. So even if most people could understand why uh, people, older people in long-term care facilities and direct service healthcare workers and other responders like that were those that we most wanted to vaccinate first for their own well-being and for society, societal well-being, a lot of people were automatically starting to say, when am I gonna get my shot? What about me? Mm -hmm. Which the good news was people, many people wanted it, but the bad news again was that when people start to think about themselves as opposed to themselves at, in, in a bigger society, that notion of equity, once again, can make some people think something's not fair. I gave you a really complicated answer, but it's the, it, it's the world we've been living in for the past almost four months now. Yeah. Um, and the, it sounds like the communication is a challenge um, because people hear things different ways um, and to make it clear for everybody um, yes. in the, in the environment of some of the perhaps distrust as well. Um, what role could employers play in not only the distribution of the vaccine, but about the dissemination of information? So I don't, I don't know if employers know how important they really are and can be. So I get to say that because we, employers can be sort of role models and champions for vaccination. But I want to stop and say that if we're asking employers to do that, then we also need to make sure that we're treating them like everybody else and saying, do you have questions? What's going to make you feel, feel good that you want to get a vaccine too, so that you can also be a role model and, and champion for others? But in terms of the, the, the culture of the workplace and, and the support of an envi supportive environment, the employers play a major role. Places that aren't big enough to have their own occupational health departments can still set up vaccine clinics if they collaborate with a local hospital, federally qualified, or some kind of community health center, or maybe their local public health department to be able to bring people in to do vaccinations for their employees. Uh, they can also make that kind of a connection and partnership to have a mobile unit come for vaccinations. Um, but as we know, even in healthcare workers early on, in some places up to 40% of people were not refusing necessarily, but saying maybe they won't be the first ones to get the shot. They're a little bit hesitant. Mm. Employers can also be, help assure there's adequate information on site, whether or not it's flyers, uh, little social media messages, um, having lunch and learns. If you have people who work different shifts, making those kinds of learning informational opportunities available to, over time. And even if this hasn't become a big issue in a lot of workplaces yet, I'm going to suggest that as more people in this country and the world start asking the question, will employers mandate vaccinations for their staff? Employers might wanna sort of take the pulse and have those conversations with their employees now and hear what people are thinking. The, you know, if there are some people who have a, you know, a role in employee health and wellness in an organization, it would be great to resource them, give them the tools so that they can be sources of reliable information at work. Because I oftentimes tell people, there's so much information out there, pick a trusted source and stick with it and sort of like turn on, like turn off some of the noise that can confuse the issue. So if workplaces can also say, here's 
here's what we want you to know today. And even if it's information that's curated from a CDC or the WHO or from the state or local health department, that might provide a big service. So being a conduit for information that's coming from those sources that you name, from the CDC, from who, yeah. state yeah. and local health departments, right. that's right. a good resource for employers to yes. gather that information? Yes, right. Okay. And, and, there, and on the CDC website, for example, there are specific links for workplace, you know, workplace related questions. The other reason that can be helpful is that it's likely that there will be unevenness in any workplace uh, um, around how many people have been vaccinated. And, and so staff are gonna be wondering, well, do I still need to wear a mask? Can I come to work around that, you know, that person? Are we still going to be testing? And so those are all the kinds of questions that you know, I want employers to be able to have information um, that they can feel confident about so that they can ensure the safety in their workplace and help their staff on, uh, believe and know that they're also thinking about their safety. Thank you. That's, um, I think it's at the front of every employer's mind of how to make the workplace safe when people are returning to work if they've been in a remote situation. Right. Um, we've also seen a lot of news coverage and about the variants of the COVID-19 virus. Um, what role do these variants play in the effectiveness of the vaccines and how are those, those being addressed? So we are still learning a lot about the, the different variants. Just yesterday, you know, I read for the first time about a, um, a way that the CDC and World Health Organization have started to put them in buckets or categories based on how, how much we need to worry about a variant when we hear about it. Because I don't know about you, but almost I wake up every day and say, okay, what's gonna be new today? Because there's gonna be new information. So those three categories are, according to the CDC and World Health Organization, variants of interest, variants, variants of concern, and variants of high concern. And as I understand them from my reading over the past day, is the ones of interest are the ones that we're hearing. There are some clusters of cases that um, uh, in an area and a number of people, the sort of the genetic testing of the virus has demonstrated that they're all linked to this variant. So there are there is an increased number of cases, but not necessarily with a lot more severe disease or mortality, but they're showing up. And there are a couple of those that have been seen. Um, there's, there's one of those kinds of variants in New York, but I'm not trying to scare the people from New York who are, are listening to our conversation. And then there are some of concern. And the ones that are concerned are deemed to be more contagious. They're, they're, and so you worry about them being more transmissible, maybe with um, a little bit more severe symptoms associated with them. And those are the ones that we've heard talked about from the United Kingdom and South Africa and Brazil, um, and I think one in California. So variants of concern. And the ones, and ones of high concern, which I have not heard anything about any in the, the US or identified um, yet, would be those that are, are cropping up, but that also are shown to have more severe disease or mortality, and they're not, they're looking like they're not, res, not responding to the vaccines or to the treatments that have been shown to be helpful right now. Uh, does, am I making yep. sense of those three levels? So for the first two levels, the of mm -hmm. interest and of concern, mm -hmm. is it, uh, my, is it our understanding that uh, the vaccines would be effective against those variants? Yes, and even, and, and, and so here's what I wanna say, it's all so new. I would not give, I would not quote statistics or, or levels of risk in any big way without good science behind it. So I'm not giving you that because we're still learning, but, but that question about the vaccines is very key. It's extremely important to say that while 
the variants are of concern and they're being observed and their effects are being observed, the vaccines still work for all of them. And the reason I want to say the vaccines still work for all of them, like once again, is that some people have said to me, we have variants. Why should I get a shot? Why should I get a vaccine? And I say, because the vaccines still work for all of them. And I'm not trying to be silly. I just want to, you know, repetition. And, and you know, here in Texas where I am and in so many places now, as people are getting sick and especially in clusters, you know, that's why it's so important to have the, the, the virologists, the, the virus scientists really looking and assessing what's going on with these. And then we can see what happens with people over time. So it's important to dispel that that idea that uh, because we have variants, I won't get the shot, the vaccine. Exactly. That that's some people have said it's too late. I, maybe maybe I need to wait for another vaccine to come around. No, that is that is not the case. And the other thing is is that the the, the vaccines um, there's the very direct effect that we talked about out with the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine and the way in which they interact um, with the spike protein, for example. Vaccines help the immune response sometimes in ways we're unaware of. So that, that notion of a vaccine keeping you from being as sick as you might be if you hadn't gotten it is really, really important. Okay, and and I just want to confirm this that there are not yet any variants that have been classified as extreme of extreme concern of, of high concern. High Correct. Concern. That's okay. right. I just looked at this. I just looked at this before we came to our Zoom. <laughs> okay, and it, it we might have more information when on the day of the conference that we can share with with our folks then. Yes. Is there any? Any last piece of information that you'd want to share with folks in terms of the equitable distribution of the vaccine? Yes, I, I, I would like to go back to what I said about scarcity and how the, uh, the challenges around feeling that all society could receive vaccine equitably at the beginning was going to exist because of scarcity, there just wasn't enough. But as we're hearing, we're, you know, the government is forecasting that in the coming months, there will be enough vaccine supply in this country for everybody who wants a shot to get one, or, or there are two shots if it's the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, right? And hopefully we're gonna continue to see global cooperation for that availability to happen in other countries, especially in developing countries, because we are a global society. We, people can't wait to travel again, so many people. We can't just isolate ourselves here. So, so with that being said, I'm still concerned that there are a numbers of, number of groups who are still on the fence more, right? And, and it's not just racial and ethnic minority groups. I would love for us, in terms of people's re availing themselves of the vaccine, to move beyond uh, wanting a vaccine to be tied to one's political party, to really trust the, the science and the benefits to one well, one's well-being as one thing. The other thing that I would say is there's so much misinformation out there, and some of it's very much targeted to particular groups that have stay on the fence or say they don't want to be vaccinated. There is a lot of information, but there's also a lot of, there's, there's so much misinformation out there that I would say that when people can stick with a trusted source of information, they have a better chance of not being harmed by somebody whose agenda might not really serve equity well if they're really anti-vaccine or anti-science. We, 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 as we're trying to be well as a society, ought not suffer unfairly and unduly because somebody else's agenda is, is scaring us off or, or eroding our trust. Nobody wins. 
Well, thank you very much for joining us today and thank you for your insightful comments. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now we have a time for some questions and uh, we'll start with, we asked a poll at the beginning. When you entered the, the session, uh, the attendees were asked a poll and I want to share the results with you. The question was, what are your thoughts on the vaccine? We had 43% of the attendees are waiting to get it. 43% already got it. 10% are still on the fence and 4% I said, I won't be getting it. What are your thoughts on that? I actually think those are numbers worth telling people about. I take those as good news numbers. And, and here's why. Uh, there's been so much talk in the country about vaccine hesitancy and then uh, reports of maybe up to 30% of people in the US who are saying, they're not quite sure they're going to get the vaccine. So to think about 10% on the fence and 4% saying no, um, really puts this group of people who responded in a place where we would say, wow, there's a lot more anticipation for and acceptance of the COVID vaccine than what some of the national polls have shown. That's really good news. Um, but it's also, along with that, good news, a reminder that we still have a way to go to get the vaccine out to everybody who wants it, including those who might want it and they're still deciding. Can I do something before you ask me another question? Absolutely. All right, I had committed to um, checking before we had this Q&A, whether or not I needed to update anything about those variants that we talked about before. And I just wanna reiterate that even though those categories were listed by the CDC and the World Health Organization, I have seen no reports of any variants of high, high concern or consideration from any place in the world. So I just wanted to, in case, I didn't wanna leave people wondering what's out there. And I didn't want people to hear the mention of a particular city or state as a signal not to go there, because basically all those, those state names represent is where, where the vaccine was found, not necessarily a place you have to stay away from. So I just wanted to clear the air with that. Thank you very much. We appreciate the follow-up on that too. So we have a question. Um, that says, uh, what percentage of the population needs to be vaccinated to return to a level of normalcy as seen as in 2019? That's um, a statistic that some people would debate. It almost gets to that question of, well, what is herd immunity and how do we reach it? Some people have said, and, and this is not just about the vaccine, that we need, most scientists would say, we need 70 to 80% of the population to be thinking that there's enough protection across all of us, among all of us, for us to feel safe. That, and that is a combination of people who've actually been vaccinated and people who are presumed to have resistance to COVID because they had it and they developed some immune response to it already. We're figuring that out. But one of the other things that we acknowledge is that this virus might behave more like a lot of other viruses that over time become more seasonal or they are what, what we call endemic. They're always sort of humming along and they're out there in a way that somebody might get them. And in that regard, even when we think about returning to normalcy, uh, that wasn't necessarily mean COVID-19 will go away. Okay. Our next question is, um, let's see, distribution obstacles are due to multiple different supply chain issues that local public health was not equipped to handle. Did you consider using military or retail pharmacy from the outset? That was something that we did talk about just the you know, the, the, the vaccine committee that I was part of acknowledged that across the entire vaccine administration system, there would be 
different kinds of federal partners that would likely participate in vaccine distribution. Uh, now, what we've also seen over the past two to three months is some of the changes and approaches as the, uh, the presidential administration has changed and the, the task forces that have been working inside the White House have really um, ramped up the different ways in which they are trying to get vaccine out. And those mechanisms have included using the military for transport, for sure. In some states, figuring out where to deploy the National Guard. Uh, retail pharmacies were also, also always a consideration. And, and the reason multiple uh, partners and modalities needed to be considered gets back to uh, the creativity and flexibility needed to reach people in different parts of the country and to be able to manage a vaccine supply that is more challenging because so many of them needed to be stored and transported at very low freezing temperatures. Okay, um, our next question, when do you think we'll be able to tell employers and employees that masks are no longer recommended? probably not as soon as anybody wants to hear. And, and here's where I say why I say that. Masks have been one of our most fundamental protective measures from the beginning. And we're still getting to a point of having enough people vaccinated and, and developing some immunity to COVID. Until we get there, we have ongoing risk of transmission, which means ongoing risk of people's getting sick and ongoing risk of having the, the, the economic and social disruptions that we've been living for the past year. The, the estimates that I've seen are even from Dr. Fauci that it may be perhaps not until sometime in 2022, that's not a, quote me, this is when it's going to be, or quote him, this is when it's going to be. But we are still learning as we see the vaccines work, as we see more people get vaccinated, we're also still learning about how we are reintroducing people to society, getting people back into workspaces, sharing more air together, not necessarily always having to be six feet apart or in the schools, three feet apart and understanding uh, how from one workplace to another, the kinds of risks that people face will also be different. So if you're in an office setting, very small setting, that might be different uh, than if you're a transportation worker, for example, where you're exposed to many people coming and going all the time. Thank you. Um, the, our next question, and this will be our last question for this session due to our time constraints, um, touches on something that you mentioned about the virus uh, humming along. Um, the question is, is it expected that this will become an annual vaccine similar to the flu vaccine or is this still being investigated? We're still learning and we're still figuring that out. But one, you know, one of the similarities uh, between COVID and influenza in a very fundamental way is what we're seeing now. The virus changes a bit. Therefore, vaccines are, are adapted and improved over time to make sure they are as effective as whatever virus is circulating at a given time. And, and that would be a reason to think about uh, the possibility that over time, other vaccines and vaccinations will be needed. But these are all of the learnings that are are ongoing right now. Okay. Well, thank you very much for, for answering our questions. And we certainly appreciate you being here for our conference. Um, it was a pleasure to hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And everyone stay well. Thank you.